Let's talk about failure. The DORA report, also known as the State of DevOps report, calls out four metrics to track for your team's performance. Two of those metrics, change failure rate and mean time to recovery, presuppose that you know how to define failure. And I've found it's actually quite complicated to really define what failure is. So I wanted to talk about different ways that we define failure in Sleuth and see if any of them match up with how your team defines failure. Let's take a look. In the last couple of weeks, my team has been so kind as to experience failure so that I have something to show you about how Sleuth tracks failure. So as you can see here, our failure rate in the last couple of weeks is 19%, which is pretty bad. This again is looking at the number of changes that go out and what percentage of them fail. So let's dig in and look at what that means and the different ways that you can track failure. So probably the most common one, the one that people do the most is they track rollbacks. Let's take a look at that. So we had a deployment that went out today where we tried to switch to G event and it didn't go so well. Sleuth tracked that by looking for a commit that went out that changed to the previous version and then it marked the original as a rollback. So this is a failure. That's the most common way that people track change failure rate. They look at how many were rolled back, but you can go deeper. I want to start probably high and go low. So the very high level is probably things like a rollback. That's very straightforward. You did a change, you had to revert the change, then that's a fail. But what about changes that cause an incident? Well, we sleuth, we track those as well. So let's take a look at failure rate and let's look at this period. I know we had some incidences on Wednesday. I'm gonna take a look at this particular case. And what you're gonna see is that our pager duty went, had an incident. So like many teams, we have different metrics that we track. We have thresholds that when they're tripped, they fire an alarm to pager duty, which then sends out messages and tells the on-call person that a failure happened. So for tracking failure, we connect Sleuth directly up to PagerDuty. So if there was a failure in PagerDuty, then we look at the latest deployment and we mark that deployment as failed. That can be really nice to point it at PagerDuty. You can also point it at incident management systems such as Blameless or Fire Hydrant. There's a number of different ones out there, but all of them kind of do the same thing, which is that top level view of failure. Status page is another good example. If you had to modify your status page to tell your customers you're having a problem, then it's pretty safe to say you're having a problem. But that's at a very high level. That can feel very disconnected to developers to know, did they cause it? Was it something else? Yes, we look at whatever the deployment went out last and call that one failed if there's an incident, but that's not always the case. So sometimes you want to go a little bit deeper. There's another type of way to track failure, and that is to have a build that runs every so often in production. And if that build fails, then you're in failure. So what you do is you take a key flow in your application, maybe it's sign up, maybe it's viewing a dashboard, something that's important, and you write a test that simulates that action. You run that every hour, every four hours in production, and if that ever fails, then that tells you that you broke something important. Now I want to show you how that works in Sleuth. I'm going to have to go back 14 days. We had a case over here where that happened. And if I scroll down here, I can see that we rolled out a new form that changed some of the flow and that flow broke our test. Now in this particular case, we didn't actually break anything for the customer, but the test broke. So that's kind of a disadvantage of using tests. Sometimes tests, particularly flaky ones, can make you think there's a failure when there's actually not a failure. So it's not perfect, but it's a really good way to have some level of confidence when you deployed something that you didn't break something in production. Because sometimes your tests pass in CI, but in production with real data, weird things happen. So this helps catch that. Finally, I want to talk about my favorite type of failure. Now, of course, you're never excited to have failure, but what I mean is this is the type of failure that I find to be the most actionable. As a developer, the easiest to understand and the easiest to try to prevent. And that is where you don't just track high level numbers such as incidences or pager status duty updates. Status duty? <laughs> it's pager duty and status page. It's pager duty updates. But instead, you look at the lower level metrics, the actual cause of failure. And then to do that, you're going to need something called anomaly detection or thresholding also works as well. So to see an example of that, I'm going to go look at this deploy. Now, this deploy went, went out. And you can see, yes, it triggered 
pager duty, but it also triggered an unhealthy alarm in our database. So in this particular case, our database was up to 46%. Now this won't trip anybody's alarms. 46% is fine from database. But what's crazy is it jumped up 34% from the previous value. That's significant. So by notifying, by tracking that and notifying the developer that happened, it gives them something much more concrete that they can dig into to figure out what happened. I'll show you how we measure that. We have a process in Sleuth that goes out to these metrics and every two minutes reads a value. We take that value, throw it into an anomaly detection algorithm and figures out what's normal and what's not. So in this particular case, we see that these values for our database are normal, but every now and then we do a change where things shoot up and that's not normal. So we need to look at that as something potentially that we did wrong. Maybe we shipped some code where instead of running a query, it's now running an N plus one query, something like that. But the point is when your developer is notified that something's unhealthy, when they're looking at the metric and they're digging in to try to understand what's behind the metric, by tracking individual metrics like this, you're able to more quickly figure out the cause of the problem and hopefully resolve it. Because at the end of the day, that's what you need. It's not enough just to measure failure, to say, hey, where change failure rate is this, or mean time to recovery is that. That's not enough. You also need to empower the developer to put things in place so that that failure never happens again. And so by measuring failure, not just at the high level, but also at the low level, you're giving the developers the insight and the tools to be able to diagnose and ideally ultimately prevent failure from happening in the future. That's how we do it at Sleuth. I would love to hear how your team defines failure. What tips and tricks do you have to measure failure? Please let me know down in the comments. There's also a webinar. We're going to talk about pull requests and different tips on how to have faster pull requests. I think also plays a lot in reducing failure. The link is down below. And finally, I stream on Twitch a couple times a week. If you want to discuss failure, pull requests, or any technical topic, please feel free to come on in and let's chat. Thanks for watching.